ready, Scott. All right. Welcome to the March 20th, 2023 Ann Arbor District Library <coughs> Board of Trustees meeting. Um, Karen, have we taken attendance? Thank you. Okay, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So move. Second. Thank you. Um, so all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that is approved. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, and now we move on to citizens' comments. Um, have we received any? I have not received any. Nothing online. Okay. <clears throat> Looks like we don't have anybody in the audience who might want to comment, so we will move Let's right along to the financial reports. So I'll hand it over to Eli. Okay, your financial report begins on page 12 with the check register. No, I'm sorry, that's last month's. It begins on page... No, that is it, yes. Okay, so the report, the narrative itself is on page 19. And uh, so this is the time of year when the cash decreases because we've realized almost all of our incoming revenue. So our cash in decreased uh, about $1.4 million uh, from $12.9 to $11.5 million, which again is what we'd expect this time of year. Um, at this point, we've received 101.04% of our budgeted tax receipts, which is good. It means we've received a little bit more than we expected. And again, those continue to trickle in through the remainder of the fiscal year. So we'll probably wind that up around 101.2 or 3, maybe. There's not a lot that comes in. It's usually just delinquent payments. So our fund balance increased from $6.7 million to $7.0 million as of February 28th. You can see that on the chart, little uptick there from January to February. Moving on to the next page, really the only thing to point out here is revenue over under expenditures. So far, our revenues exceed expenses by $1.3 million. Uh, and our current revenues are 66.2% of the approved budget and expenses are 59% of the approved budget. This is the eight month into the fiscal year. So we are 66.66% of the way through the fiscal year. So we're right on target with revenue and under target where we'd like to be with expenses. Uh, so then if you'll turn to page 22, Again, you're looking for things that are over 66%. So you can see penal fines, we received more than expected. Again, that's all the, basically all of the citations that are received within our district. So that often is over what we expect just because you never know how much to expect. We can budget that conservatively. Uh, and then you can see we had uh, another down month for investment gains, but overall we're on track to come pretty close to what our budget was, a very small amount of money from investment gains, most because, again, that's offset by the loss of value in bonds as inflation eats away the yield. Um, copier revenue is... Uh, much, much lower than what we would expect, which is, but it's still a, it's a tiny, tiny line item, $10,000 for the year. Then you can see grants, memorials, library fines, and non-resident fees are all above what we expect, 200%, uh, 160%, and 100% so far. But again, those three together add up to a budget of $35,000, so not a lot of money there as well. And rental revenue right on track, that's almost exclusively Sweetwaters. Uh, so our total revenue, 66.2%, exactly where we'd want to be. Uh, and then looking at our expenditures, so we're at 60% on salaries and wages, which is good. That gives us a little bit of overhead. But again, as I've been talking about, we're over on benefits as because of a projection error that we made when we were developing the budget, and we'll be bringing you into a budget adjustment uh, at the June, be June board meeting uh, to make that final adjustment so we see where it comes in at. Um, the only other things that are really... Uh, Anything worth note, we're right on track with materials, which is great. Often we leave some of that money on the table. So this is great to see that we are already at 66.9% of that, uh, which is right where we want to be. Uh, copier expense, again, a little over because of the expenses, but it, that's a $50,000 line item for the whole year. 
Repairs and maintenance is just a little bit over, but that's one that really comes and goes over the course of the year, not overly concerned there. Other operating expenses is way over, but that's like a catch-all line item just to catch things that don't. And you can see the budget for the entire year is $27,000. So that's only over by $5,000. We will be making an adjustment to that at the end of the year once we see uh, how that all comes in. And then most importantly, capital outlay. We've only spent 11% of that so far. Uh, I do expect that that will finish substantially under budget because uh, we didn't have any major expenses with the plaza. However, Len is going to test drive an electric delivery truck in the next couple weeks. So that could be a substantial purchase. So uh, we will be bringing that to the board because it's way above our approval threshold. And uh, once we have a chance to look at it, they're built here in Novi. Uh, it's a really great product. We're very excited about it. And most importantly, they have a number of them on the road in northern climates, which is something that we're looking for for that stuff. So that's exciting. And that brings us to revenue over expenditures so far for the year of $1.4 million. I think when all said and done, we'll finish the year right between $1.4 and $1.5 million because we'll start to have some bigger expenses related to the summer programming starting to catch us up a little bit. So that is the financial report. Any questions? I kind of lost track a little bit on, um, so some of the, the, the 11% in capital outlay is related to timing, essentially. With it's because we were hoping to be buying like furniture for the plaza <clears throat> this year. So that's going to yeah. finish the year way under, and then we'll be asking you to make to move that into the capital fund so then it can be used to outfit the plaza next year when it's actually done. So it'll just, it'll, we'll carry it. We'll not carry it forward, but we'll, we'll essentially move it into the capital into fund. Move it into the new yeah. fiscal year. And then in terms of the um, fund balance, um, would you remind us if there's additional, what we think additionally will be spent for, from the fund balance in terms of capital? At this point, we're not forecasting no, any further, nothing, nothing okay. out, of the ca out of the fund balance at this point. Everything is within the operating budget. Okay. And if we purchase this vehicle, where? where that where would come out of capital that, outlay, kind of so capital out of the outlay. existing budget. We're taking advantage of that line being <clears throat> so far under yeah. to be able to, to move on that this year. Terrific. What is the maker of the electric vehicle? Len? <laughs> motive it's like m-o-t-i-v right because you can't have all the letters in a word thank you right? <laughs> thank you <laughs> appreciate it how's the other electric vehicle going their little e-bike the e-bike you know it was quite a saga getting it to work because it arrived without a functioning e chassis and but then there but ultimately we were able to work with uh, rei helped fix it so, and it made several missions at the end of the year, and then it goes away for the winter, and in the next couple of weeks, they'll be coming back out for the spring season. Yay. So that is a lot of fun. We have a, a lot of people who are interested in getting on that and pedaling it around town. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Eli. Um, so now we move on to committee reports. Um, so the executive committee uh, met uh, just before this meeting, um, and mostly to discuss potential agenda items, um, work out our upcoming uh, meeting schedule. So two things to be aware of, we'll be coordinating this with Karen, is we are planning to have closed session at the next two board meetings, um, one for discussion of the director evaluation at the next meeting, and the one in May, for a uh, FOIA open meeting acts. Opinion of council. Opinion of council, yeah. So we'll, we'll get some advice from our attorneys on how to make sure we're stay, you know, acting in the spirit and letter of the law. So um, that is something to prepare for. And I think that is everything in broad strokes. Do you um, have yeah. any um, thoughts about what, what we're gonna like how the process will work for the the eval like leading up to that meeting on the 24th yes so i will be so um eli's already prepared a his his evaluation which we've reviewed <laughs> we'll be sharing that with the rest of the board and i will be sending out the form for you all to kind of fill out and work through this week okay um and i, and I was planning to talk to cat and aiden about that just to give them a heads up on how that works after this meeting so you'll get that this week, and I will send that with a deadline on it, but you should have a couple weeks to work on it. And then um, 
I'll be compiling those results and I'll be working probably with, with Molly on drafting the final evaluation that we will all get a chance to see next month and then we'll be able to present it in May. Great. So that's the timeline. Any other questions on that? Okay. Cool. All right. That's all from executive committee. So we have budget and finance committee. Yes. Yeah, so we met a couple. That's my mic on. Yeah. Um, we met a couple weeks ago, and Eli helped to orient the new finance committee members. Um, and we just talked about sort of the pre-budget planning for the next fiscal year. Uh, and there will be a draft budget in April that the budget, the financial committee will um, will discuss, and then there'll be a final budget in May um, that will be brought to the full board. And between April and May, uh, the equalization report will 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 know what what the adjustments will be um, to make those final changes. So that's it, I think, right? Is there anything else? Yeah, any questions? No. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. All right. And then moving back to, along to the library report and back to Eli. Okay. So here's the library report for this month. If you guys can bring it up on the screen. All right. So our stat of the month, uh, this month, we're going to look at meeting room bookings. Now, these are just the self bookings. So this does not include room rentals. This doesn't include library events. Uh, this is just people who are booking rooms for themselves uh, online. Uh, so you can see that's been on a very nice uh, uptick starting from July 22nd, going all the way up to uh, last month. And you can see we had a total of 500, just under 500 uh, room bookings. And in February of 2020, we had 526. So that is really close back to sort of pre-pandemic levels as far as utilization of the room use. So we're very glad to see that. Looking at which rooms are booked the most, here's by location and by room, which rooms are booked the most. Uh, that's combining the whole period from July 22nd through the end of last month. You can see Westgate far and away the most popular location to book a room. Um, not just the cafe, but also those are two enclosed rooms, which we find people like a lot. We did the best we could to kind of add uh, rooms at the branches, but none of them are as well isolated sound-wise as the ones that were built for that purpose here at the downtown library and at the Westgate branch. You can see actually Pittsfield had a slightly larger number of room bookings than downtown, which Pittsfield never has more of anything than any <laughs> other location. It is really, it is typically the slower of the, th of the three, uh, the three satellite branches. And so that was really great to see that those rooms have been booked so much. The Muskrat Room, uh, which is a large room and seats 35 people, has been getting a lot of use out there. So that's been really great to see that be used. Uh, and then at Mallets, you got a good amount of use of the Rain Garden and the River Birch Room. And you can kind of see across downtown Pittsfield, Mallets, and Traverwood, that most used room is pretty evenly used across all four of those locations, about 200 plus bookings. So that's wonderful to see that. Um, we do have some uh, sound baffles we're trying to do for the Traverwood room uh, to make it a little bit more private, but there's just, you know, the, the main issue is you can't really make them in closed rooms because then there's ventilation mm -hmm. uh, it, code requirements and impacts on that, and it just gets really expensive really fast. So it's very rare that we have a usage that doesn't work well in these semi-enclosed rooms. But occasionally there's some, con when it's really quiet, sometimes there's conflict uh, when someone is talking loudly on a phone or other device. But for the most part, it works out very well and people are very happy with these rooms. The one thing is that we do not um, cancel anyone's booking. Like if they have their booking and they don't show up, it's still theirs until it's over. And at Westgate, sometimes that gets a little intense mm -hmm. when people don't show up for their room booking and someone else can go in there until they show up. But if they show up, they, they don't, have not forfeit their time. So we're always working to balance that. Um, we have in the past canceled future bookings for people who have repeatedly not shown up for their bookings so that we're taking them off the calendar, freeing them up. But for the most part, it works out pretty well. Um, and it's a smooth, well-oiled machine to get all those room books and to get everybody into those rooms and other rooms. So that's it on the start of the month. Any question about that? 
All right, so upcoming event, we're very excited about Full Moon coming up on Friday, April 7th from 7 to 10 p.m. at the Carytown Farmer's Market. We will be hosting one of the luminary processionals. Starts here at the Downtown Library. You meet up between 8 and 8.30 right after the library closes, and then we will proceed down to Carytown with the luminaries. We will have, I believe, a uh, rock band from Community High School will be playing on the pad to uh, entertain us as we are forming up. And uh, if the weather is good, I will be debuting a new musical instrument that I have invented, but it's not waterproof. So <laughs> it's only if the weather is good will we get to see that. So hopefully that will, we'll have good weather as always. Um, for our staff spotlight this month, we're featuring Matt Gauntlet from the uh, video production team. He's a production technician. He's been with AEDL for 13 years. He was first hired in 2009 as a part-time maintenance worker. He was promoted to a part-time techno host, which is a position we don't actually have anymore, uh, in 2014. And then 2015, he was promoted to a full-time production technician. So he's been on that team for a long time. And what do you wish people you worked with knew about you? I genuinely love the wide variety of audio video work that I get to do with all of the fine staff at AADL across the entire system, even if I'd almost always rather be playing guitar for my two corgis. <laughs> So Matt's a great photo of Matt on his honeymoon with his uh, library stuff bag. Matt also did a lot of the music for the Saturday show. If you've seen the H-O-M-E-S, uh, the Great Lakes song, the two very shred-worthy guitar solos <laughs> are both, uh, both Matt showing off various items from his collection. So uh, thank you, Matt, for all of your great work for that. All right, coming up in April, AADL will be observing Arab American Heritage Month with a number of events in the month of April, as well as archived events and other videos. As we, uh, in many cases, we, it's a good opportunity for us to re-highlight things that happened in the past and get some more views for them uh, and really help people see some of the things that we've already done uh, in this space. But we'll always have some new content and that's coming up in April. Uh, ADL in the community. So for the 2023 sponsor, ADL is a sponsor of the AFC Ann Arbor men's and women's soccer teams. Uh, AFC Ann Arbor competes in the United Soccer League, which is one league below the Major League Soccer. Uh, the teams really do a lot of great community outreach. It's really terrific, all the things that they've done. Last year, we tabled at their community iftar, which was a really terrific event, especially because a lot of the families that were there were not typical library families. And so it was a really great way for us to get our products and services in front of a new audience. And so we'll be one of their sponsors this year, and they will be doing their season ticket holder pickup at Westgate Branch on April 8th from 1 to 5 p.m. So people can drop by, learn more about the program, pick up their tickets if they had gotten some, and they will get to meet their squirrel mascot, Nutmeg, who is their, uh, <laughs> their squirrel. That is, I am told by our sports people that Nutmeg is a, is a, sport, is a soccer thing is. of some kind. Yes. So I'll take their word for it. <laughs> All right, ADL Archives. We received a wonderful contact us from David Barricklow, former owner of Dom Bakeries in Ypsilanti. This is him in the picture. A longtime friend alerted him that his photo appeared in AADL's 22-23 Archives calendar, which was a summer game prize, and he requested a copy of the photo if we had one. He currently lives in Wilkesboro, where he operates Dom Bakeries, North Carolina. So Dom <laughs> Bakeries survives in North Carolina. And the funniest thing about this is about a week later, his daughter emailed us asking if she could get a photo to surprise him with. And we said, well, sorry, you gotta act fast to beat the uh, Facebook trading of uh, <laughs> historic images from our collection. So he had already found it himself, but that was great to hear from him. Here's our mention of the month. This is from Instagram. This is from uh, Ah Kim. Yesterday marked one year since we arrived in Ann Arbor. I've had so many wonderful moments in just 12 short months, but some of my favorite people, places, and things in no particular order include the Peony Garden, Yoon's Bakery, Nyang, Nyang Myon at Tomokun, the Shorty at Bow Boys, growing potatoes in my own backyard, art fair with friends, being a staff pick at Literati, fried chicken at Ma Lu's, my first in-store reading at Book Suite, slices from Joe's, the botanical garden, craft classes at AADL, my welcoming neighbors, my supportive writing community, pet snack station at Downtown Home and Garden, Miss Kim's Saturday Farmer's Market, oysters from Monahan's. There's so much I've left off, but you get the idea. Life is good. And just a lovely post of someone reviewing their first year living here in Ann Arbor, and we featured prominently, so that was great. Here's another mention we just wanted to share from Bill Van Loo, who's a teacher at STEAM. 
Oh, I think he's at Pioneer now. He had been at Steam. Uh, we got a message this morning that our power was out, which came as quite a surprise. We haven't had snow since Friday night, and it was sunny and beautiful outside. Thankfully, we were able to get out of the house, do some errands, and ended up at the gorgeous AADL Traverwood branch so we could plan and get ready for the teaching week. AEDL has some of the best architecture around, and this building is one of my favorites. It incorporates the wooded hilly site beautifully. It's especially lovely around dusk. Thanks for providing us space, power, Wi-Fi, and a great view. And best of all, just as we were settling in, we got a text that our power's back on. <laughs> so good day at the library from Bill. All right, so here's our compliment of the month. Patron who uses a wheelchair wanted to compliment us on the ease of access to the restrooms on the first floor, saying they are the best in the state. And when we saw that came in, I was like, that one is going in the report. You better <laughs> believe it. And then we looked for a relative complaint to go with that. And here's one that we received via a comment card. The lack of helpful and realistically usable handicap parking is a travesty. And as a comment card received at the downtown library, it is certainly tricky. And we really do not have any good solutions for that. So it is unfortunate that we're not able to provide uh, better parking for that, uh, that audience. There are some spots in the lot across the street. There are some on the street as well, but they are not very close to the front door. So in many cases, when we get comments like this, we reach out and let people know, well, the branches have a lot better access for these sorts of things. For people who are already driving, they will often have better access to the branches. Also, we have the lockers at the branches. And of course, when people are unable to get in the building, we have a number of ways that we work with them to try to keep their access to the library. And that is it. That's my report for this month. Any questions? Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Eli. Um, and moving on to New business. We have one item on the agenda for tonight. Um, the to hear the results of the Epic MRA survey that we'd recently commissioned. So we have, I think it's John Cavanaugh here from Epic MRA to present on that. So welcome. I'm here to present the. Uh, fifth in a series of what had been biennial uh, surveys beginning back in 2012. Uh, Eli contacted me after the pandemic hiatus. Uh, it was probably wise not to attempt a survey during that mayhem because uh, it, <clears throat> I'm convinced you'd have aberrant results. Uh, you know, visitorship, et cetera being high among them. So uh, we picked it up again. We were gonna do it last year. However, uh, all the rest of them had been in the first quarter of a year, first calendar quarter. And that made great sense uh, to uh, again commission it for 2023 first quarter, moving off that even year uh, schedule. It, it, as it turns out, I am uh, pleased with the results. I hope you find some insights into some things. We, we altered quite a bit the survey uh, from prior years, not focusing so much on uh, existing programs and services and their use and helpfulness. And I'll move on with uh, some of the others here. Uh, I pretty much just said that in the prologue. Uh, it was a 400 sample interview uh, conducted last month. We have steadily increased with the number of cell phone percentages. We started out with none in 2012, all landline, and this time around it's 70% cells. Uh, 400 qualified respondents. We have gone back and forth between 400 and 500 uh, interviews. The margin of error difference is not that great between the two. The, the largest benefit in getting a larger sample size is your subsets are larger and you can dice them up a little bit more. Uh, the subset margins of error here, uh, it's no surprise that Ann Arbor City residents comprise the largest portion of them. And that margin of error is five point, more or less plus or minus six, six point percentage points. The reason I have that up there is you also have, as part of the service, the cross tabulation report. And those are what they're, that's part of it, is a breakdown between Pittsfield and the balance of the non Ann Arbor City residents. 
So just in case you are wondering what that is all about, that's, that's why is because the cross tabulation report breaks those regions out for you. Uh, the degree of confidence, 19 times out of a, uh, 20, you'll get the same answers within the margin of error. That's all that means. Uh, consistent with prior results, 93% uh, of the respondents are not in, currently enrolled in post high school education. Uh, some new questions we added this time around were length of residency, intent to stay, and uh, similar questions in the, another question in the demographic report. But about 75% see their remaining in this area for the foreseeable future. Now that is a highly subjective in terms of number of years, but in the demographic section, we've got over seven and 10 reporting an intent to maintain a local household from at least 10 years on. Student status, I mentioned, 93%, uh, and then years of resident, you've, you've got 71% who are 10 plus. Uh, you've got 63%, nearly two thirds, reporting at least a few times a year visiting a facility. Uh, with that breakdown of total visitation in the past couple of years at 72%. I draw some attention to that. Prior results have seen slightly higher proportions of visitation. Um, I looked back, some minor wording difference in how the questions ask, have you ever visited in prior surveys? And we put an emphasis in this questionnaire to ask in the past few years because we had some COVID and pandemic related questions and how it did or did not affect uh, visitation behavior. No surprise here. Uh, as Eli showed, the meeting room bit, uh, particularly at Westgate, but that is fairly consistent across time as well. Uh, the, over a, a strong majority, over 60% indicate their current use, current use of AADL services has not changed by virtue of the pandemic. Uh, about a quarter, fewer current physical visits. Um, I would attribute that to, and it's speculation, it's guts, not wisdom, but uh, during the pandemic, if visitation was limited, you made more use of online. And that, that simply makes sense to me that that figure is higher than it had been in prior years. Uh, still, 60% currently access eight, your services in person. And we've got a chart, of no effect on current behavior, uh, about uh, and a large proportion of those who access in person do, do so always. 27% of that total of 61% who access your services uh, do, do so in person all the time for a total combined with mostly at 61%. They, people who visit here are quite comfortable with it. Only 2% reported that they were not at all comfortable by virtue of the pandemic in making an in-person visit. That's uh, well within the margin of error. And of those who do currently visit, they are very comfortable, the vast majority are, as opposed to being just somewhat. <clears throat> we asked a new question about a service that would uh, allow give and take of personal collection items. Uh, we have about two thirds expressing some interest. 
and most of them would be interested in both lending and borrowing personal collection items. Um, you continue to have very high positive ratings. We asked the question, would you give, based on what you know or have heard, a positive rating of excellent or pretty good, or a negative rating of just fair or poor? Uh, we also found out that, uh, that your current operating millage rate is not nearly as uh, causes as much bristling as does local tax rate st and tax rates uh, on the state level, particularly the local rate. Your positive rating, you get excellent, well over half of your total is in the excellent portion. And 3%, I am amazed that that's just in the single digits, although it's been fairly consistent over time. And that shows that timeline. Perception of the local tax burden has gone back up to where it was when we first started doing this. In fact, it's its highest level ever. And nearly half of those respondents, the question is phrased, in return for what you get in uh, local services, would you say your taxes are too high, too low, or about right? If they say too high, would that be much or just somewhat? It's about an even split between, so the intensity of belief is, is quite high when it comes to local taxes. That makes some sense. Uh, the district has seen uh, several millage proposals, ambitious ones, pass. And uh, I, there, this might be some evidence of fatigue. And later on in the presentation, it would corroborate that observation. Comparison of the tax burdens, yours at 14%, that's almost not even worth mentioning, is that uh, a mere 14% believe their tax load is too high in return for what you deliver. And that has been consistent over time. Despite that, um, the a majority would opt for renovation over building new when directly asked the question about the downtown facility. Despite their perception that their taxes are, are fine when it comes to supporting the library, uh, fewer than one in four respondents strongly support a 0.5 mil increase. And while the overall support goes up significantly when that follow-up question, well, if you didn't like 0.5, how about 0.25? Uh, overall support goes up considerably, but the strong support does not. Uh, and in a follow-up question among no and undecided in that question, well, what would you be willing to pay? And it was an annual dollar amount of just over $4.50 median. Um, doesn't get you a new building, I guess, is what. <laughs> <laughs> so that half mil increase at 57% total support, that might sound encouraging at first. When we do this and apply it in a actual proposal situation, in a millage, we say, how would you vote? Would you vote yes to support it or vote no to oppose it? And among the undecided, initially undecided, we'll ask, well, if the election were held today, which way would you lean? Would you lean yes, lean no? That corresponds here to the strong and somewhat. An unequivocal yes or no answer is in the blue portion of that. And, un and when pressed, that's the yellow portion of those bars. They're leaning to oppose or leaning toward support. Uh, in millage election questions, leaners are notoriously unreliable yes votes. So 
So we'd like to see strong support around 50% or higher and overall support at 60% or higher. In all the school and library millage elections we've done over the course of the past three decades. The quarter mill increase, as I said, you go up 20 points in total support, but the strong support doesn't go up that much at all. Unequivocal strong. And remember, this is sort of like the let's make a deal presentation of this. Well, if you didn't go for 0.5, how about 0.25? Some will just say fine, you know, that, that's better. Compared with the 2018 test we did, you can see the strong, solid portions of those votes are much more, they dominate the bar. Sure. Cold vote means there might be a proposal on the ballot that would raise your taxes by X. Would you vote yes or no? And with information is, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the proposal. Now knowing this, would you vote yes or no? So with information, obviously you went up eight percentage points in solid, unequivocal yes vote. Much higher support is reported for the low co-location option. We recited generally what that means and that other cities around the country have done it and typically uh, it is the non-library use is multi-unit housing. That received the same type of total support as the 0.25 millage but the strong support is double. As far as what type of use for that multi-unit housing, a mixed age in income was the clear favorite, capturing a majority of those who responded to the question. That's really interesting too. Go back one slide there, John. Don't miss the university students slice there. <laughs> yeah, but also seniors. I thought seniors would be higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. So was this question um, framed where they were asked to pick one of uh, the list? It was. Okay. I believe, let me just verify that. If AADL were to look into that possibility of co-location, the likely use for the other building, uh, other portion of the building would be for multi-unit housing, which is typical in other urban centers using this concept. If this were the case, would you prefer to see the focus on housing before, and then we rotate, uh, randomly rotated five options? So seniors were, among people who responded to this, read that, uh, that was read first. Mixed use was read first, 20% of the time, et cetera. So uh, it was, that was presented first, but yes, they had one option. Okay, so it was like, the, this is the, the top preference of the, that set of five. Yep. That, in a nutshell, is what transpired. Uh, I also sent along the comparison frequency report uh, in case you were interested in comparing some of the other questions uh, to prior surveys. I will be forthcoming with a textual narrative that will knock out each question uh, and then provide what I picked off for each of them as significant deviations among subgroups. If you're looking at those cross tabs, be careful. And, uh, another thing, uh, reason I pulled up the Pittsfield, Ann Arbor, and non, other non-Ann Arbor respondent totals is typically I won't look at anything that has under 40 respondents in it. I mean, your margin of error becomes 14 points. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if, if it's a 50-50 question, it could just as easily be 64 to 36. So, 
Um, but that will be forthcoming in the next week or so. I'm happy to field any questions on this. Uh, we, it's always a pleasure to do this because uh, executing it, uh, you know, a 400 sample survey of this interview length is usually uh, a bit of a bear to plow through, uh, but we did it in six evenings. So uh, it's typically, we'll get decent response from, from the subject audience, which again is uh, uh, anecdotal proof that you're widely respected, so people will stay on the phone for it. I have a question for you. Yes. So you noted the other surveys that you do for other institutions. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, now that I've been through a couple of these, it's, um, it's hard to watch how high our approval rating consistently is and then see how that matches with people's willingness to, to go for um, some sort of millage support. Um, and so I wonder when you do these for like a school or another institution that might go for a millage, um, how do we differ? Like, is our situation unusual? It feels unusual. Like everyone loves us, but they're like, eh, you have just the right amount of money. <laughs> that doesn't feel normal to me. I, I would imagine people would have more mixed feelings about say the school district, but then, you know, time after time, the school district asks for money and everyone's like, sure. Not everywhere. <laughs> okay. So if you could sort of elaborate about how are we very strange or is this normal? <laughs> well, I guess that, is that a, can you have a, I guess go the question would be like, what, what do you make of yeah. the approval rating against like people's willingness I think to there go is for a millage? Because local millage fatigue, to yeah. be honest yeah. with you. The, the local school district, uh, it's no <laughs> secret, we did the survey for them right. when they passed the first billion dollar <laughs> bond in the state. Uh, there, if I'm not mistaken, a housing millage recently. Uh, any worthy cause has at one time or another considered asking the property owners in the Ann Arbor School District to pony up, well, it's just 0.25 mil, so it's just half a mil. Right. Um, and given the fact that you, you know, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with your delivery of services. So, uh, you know, it's not a matter of, geez, you know, we realize you're operating on a shoestring, but we still think you're doing a great job. Uh, finances for the library is not front and center on folks' minds. Totally, right. Unlike school districts, uh, where at least a third Roughly a third of any given district's population has parents of school-aged children. Um, so they are a little bit better versed in, oh, whether it's a legitimate complaint or not uh, about deficiencies uh, in physical plant in school districts. I guess the, the, the kind of other thing you're kind of picking at is like, I don't know what APS was surveying on. Are they asking people what their appetite is for a, a millage for their particular issues in their survey? And, you know, do they get a 25% appetite and then they just do it anyway? Like how, like, no, well, I, I, I guess mean, the question is like how much, like we've, we've, we we're doing the survey, surveying, but like how much of it tells us how much of a like gap we have to fill in a, in a millage campaign versus, versus like we just shouldn't do it. Well, <clears throat> be mindful of the fact too that there wasn't anything concrete to present to the respondent in this survey. Right, right. just a concept of a idea basically, right? Like, right, like I mean it, it starts out by saying yeah. there are no concrete plans for right. this, but if, um, so, uh, that is part of it too, I think, yeah. in, in terms of low enthusiasm. Um, it didn't have a follow-up as uh, typically in a school district survey that we do for a millage, or a library survey for that matter, 
Um, we'll start out with, as I, there's a slide up there that says cold versus informed. Mm -hmm. Often we'll do a third one after argument. Mm. And you'll line up pro-con arguments and measure the resonance mm -hmm. of each. Oh, that's interesting. You'll line up, informed vote is usually line, is taken after you've lined up 10 different items that that millage would pay for and find out the level of support for each individual item. Uh, for school districts, it always comes out that, uh, or typically comes out that increased security, technology will get very strong support as components to be paid for <clears throat> out of the proposed millage. Yeah. Uh, AstroTurf, not so much. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, but, you know, it depends on the area of the state. Uh, Rockford, Michigan, God bless them, they, they like their artificial turf. <laughs> <laughs> Good for them. Well, it's interesting, too, because when you start to, like, when you ask the co-location question, which is much more specific mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than the, like, the interest goes up. I mean, I know it's not correlated to the millage question, but. Well, it is somewhat because yeah. the, it introduced the respondent by saying another concept mm -hmm. which has uh, either reduced or eliminated the need to ask local taxpayers right. is co-location. Right. Um, that, that piqued their interest. Yeah. I do think we're just in this boat of the millage in perpetuity, making it so that we are never in front of people saying, if you don't say yes to this, no more library. We've, yeah. we, that's not our argument that we're ever gonna be making. And so, like, we are just in a very different position. Like, cause when the schools are coming or when anyone else is coming, they're like, if, the, if you don't say yes, we're not gonna go forward with whatever it is mm -hmm. that's on the list. And that's true for a renovation or a new building, but it's different than, it doesn't have the heart tug of, right. of you know, this is how the library continues to exist. Although, you know, you, by virtue of the Headley Amendment, your, your operating millage right. does erode. Yeah. No, that's true. Any other questions? I, I mean, I, I have more thoughts. But right, I know. They're <laughs> less not really questions. More. I mean, if we're, if we're having a discussion or a conversation, I mean, I'm just like, I am thinking about, again, the persistent issue of everything feeling polished, finished, and delivered at a high level. Therefore, when you ask people what their appetite is to renovate or not renovate, but to like tear this building down and build a new one, they don't have, a, they don't know why. And it feels like a real communications crisis because internally we know that like this is not a sustainable situation um, and we are also continuing to pour millions and millions of dollars into a building and we're just sort of delaying an inevitable moment when like something has to happen here. Um, and so I just, I really think it's a big, it's a big strategic communications puzzle because we have to find a way to be like, yes, what you love is going well and, pro and probably not going away, but what's happening here in the infrastructure here is not a sustainable situation. No. I haven't beaten the drum. No, yeah, no, I mean, no. it's like, this is my whole thing with the, like, the lobbytorium. Mm -hmm. It's like we make our deficiencies feel really cute and awesome. <laughs> um, and really, like, it's not a laboratorium. It's a lobby well, and, that we're just retrofitting. And you know? we would, as an organization, <clears throat> we would never take a broken window and put tape on it and no. let it sit for six months. That's right. And that's something that people encounter right. at their kids' schools. Yeah. Right. All right, just to pause for a second. If we don't have questions for, for Mr. Kavanaugh. Oh, thank um, you, yes. <laughs> wait, maybe we'll have more, but we do have some time for discussion if we want to kind of just noodle on some of the, the findings. Uh, at the table here if there's more discussion to have. But so he doesn't have to stand at the podium while we <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. You are quite Very welcome. Helpful. Thank you. Uh, John, one more question before you take off, which yeah. is to say, um, in in doing the cross tabbing, is there anything just, you know, like off the top of your head immediately that in terms of like generational age categories or or do you think, you know, are the are the, the groups just too small? 
No. Um, let's take maybe question 20, which is the half mill per notion of yeah. a half mill. Um, you know, what you might expect, I think, I don't know Ann Arbor ward politics well enough to say this is typical, but there are differences. Mm -hmm. uh, where the overall support was 56% for that, Ward 3 was at 75. Whoa. Mm. Okay. Again, 64 respondents from that ward. Yeah. Um, ward 3 is the only outlier? Uh, yes. Interesting. Those who attend college, all 28 of them, <laughs> uh, supported that at 76%. Mm. Uh, correlated to that, those who are only zero to three year residents hmm. are highly supportive of it. That's interesting. Those who plan on moving are more supportive of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Curiously, though, um, well, this is among those who believe Michigan's state tax load is about right, you have higher support. Hmm. Um, local tax burden about right is higher support. Not, a, not huge. Um, some really small end sizes here, so I'm yeah. reluctant to say. But that's helpful, and some of that you'll be talking about in the narrative too, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, what, what it will appear like in the narrative is a question by question analysis, so that question 20 or whatever it was, will have a demographic breakout of those demographic subgroups of sufficient end size mm -hmm. who deviated from the norm. Yeah, okay, great. Well, thank you. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. It's particularly helpful that it is always you, I think, because yeah. you've really watched this over a long time now, and yeah. so yeah. your comments are very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot, John. Yeah. I'm so sure other people have something to say, but I, it is hard to watch that because 2018, we had pretty high numbers there for a moment and we didn't do anything. Like we kind of did some stuff, we did some investigating, but then the pandemic happened and we, we lost so much ground. Like now those yellow sections are huge compared to what they were. And I feel like, like the downtown kind of like stopping being what it was in 2019 is a that's a lot of headwind mm -hmm. and so i i don't have i feel a little bit depressed about <laughs> <laughs> how to like turn it around and get that going well, and i i do wonder you know the the pandemic effect like i feel like especially in ann arbor where the the culture was of extreme caution you know compared yeah. to lots of other communities like i feel like a lot of people are still trying to kind of like just getting back in the swing of things yeah you know and so i just wonder if that is a piece of the puzzle of you know it's not just a financial thing but it's also a like oh right like going downtown yeah right like, <laughs> like and stuff. is yeah. is a sl is slower to creep back so i just think that from like a psychological standpoint, like mm -hmm. think like thinking about the downtown building, you know, the way I as a patron think about the downtown building and what it means to me and my family, you know, like getting back in touch with that, you know, mm -hmm. what it was like for me in 2018 to like bring my kids to story time and to have all of these right. different things going on. And I feel like people are just sort of starting to come back to that. That's a good point. There's also just the different financial, like we're in this moment of inflation. Yeah. Um, we have had like three major city villages, I think, between mm -hmm. 2018 mm -hmm. and now. Maybe, am I three? 
climate, housing, um, other one. When was the schools? Schools. Yeah. schools. Uh, the schools was huge. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the thing the thing I wrestle with with all of this is that there's, we have like if we could have a conversation with everybody <laughs> to kind of figure out where people are because are, right. it's hard to tell from even these kinds of results what people really mean, right? Like, because yeah. what does co-location mean? Like, and the options within that range, like certain choices we make there could really pay for a lot, and other choices we might make there might be a great partner and provide some additional benefit to the community that everybody's really excited about, but might not be bringing cash to the point where it makes a difference in terms of what we can actually do on the site. Um, and so figuring out how to balance all of that is I think the big challenge as we kind of figure out how to go forward. It's interesting to see how much support there was there though for doing something co-located on the site. But it, then it'll be interesting to see if we explore that avenue further how the community reacts to the realities of like what those different options look like and, and how, what the outcomes then will be. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to think about. I'm excited to dig in a little bit more on the, um, on the stats. I don't know if anybody has any other observations or thoughts or reflections on the, especially on the Millager downtown branch stuff. I have another question, but I'll wait. And I was concerned that we would find out that there was no appetite for any sort of housing related project mm -hmm. with the library. I was, I would not have been surprised at all if that had pulled extremely poorly. And I saw this and I was like, whoa, there's 75% of people are open to this, mm -hmm. which was much higher than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. So what that really showed to me is, is that the, the notion of there being a housing crisis and the library site as being something that could help address that mm -hmm. is something that resonates with people. And I was, I was very surprised to see that trend that direction. Mm -hmm. And also it's good to see that you know, as unsurprisingly, when you look at a smaller ask, you move people. Mm -hmm. And those two things go together, right? The, the smaller ask and the partnership as a revenue source. Mm -hmm. Well, and Jim, to your conversation about, or your, you know, point about the vision of what is needed and what we know is needed you know, what the choices are. It's like, are we going to keep pouring money into a building that's not really serving the community in the way that it could? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've learned being on the board and being interested in the library, what other models there are mm -hmm. for a downtown library, you know, for like a, for like a community space, mm -hmm. a, a building that's designed as a community space. And I think people don't a lot of people don't even have that as like a concept right you know and so you i think you were saying like is there a way to bring that concept and how would you do that you know how would you educate people as to mm -hmm. what the possibilities are and i don't i don't really know the answer to that but you know that's a question to ask is like you know thinking about what this organization is capable of given a space that actually like creates more community space um you know it, it's like they do so well we do so well with with what we have but like how do you communicate what more would be possible um, I also, this is Kat, um, I also think that one thing, like whatever decision that we land on, we have to make sure that we have a really strong advocacy, like structure that we're going to pursue and put into motion because we've seen a lot of things really fall to the wayside and so that's like my area and where I've done a lot of work but I just think that no matter what because of the sensitivity of this issue, we have to have a really, really strong advocacy plan. Um, and work with staff and everyone to get on that same page and use that same verbiage because I think it would really help this project thrive a lot more. Anything else? So I had one other question, which is I'm curious what um, staff's thoughts are on the responses related to these personal collection lending yeah. questions because that was a new idea. Um, and I'm, I'm like, did that change your orientation on whether you 
planning to try that or not try that? No, you know, it was about what I was expected. You know, I was mostly looking to see if there was, as John says, tepid interest in it. And it was <laughs> not tepid interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, about two thirds of the community, not just of library users, mm -hmm. were interested in that. And really the operational benefits are why we do it. You know, it's like a project like that, the biggest advantage is you wouldn't have to buy as many copies mm -hmm. of something at its moment of maximum you know, interest. So to me, that's like a green light to try it because it's not an expensive project. Mm -hmm. It's something that we can develop with internal resources. It's not something that really has any physical footprint at all beside a place on the hold shelves. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity to do that, but also it's like, we'll tackle it when the time is right. And mm -hmm. there's, you know, some development to be done between here and there. Sure. But I think it's really, it's leveling up the notion of a little free library and mm -hmm. getting everyone's sort of personal collections out moving around town so long as they understand it might not come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that'll be built into the process from the beginning. So to me, that was very much a green light to like, go ahead and try this, try a pilot, put it together. So it's something that we were just talking about with the IT team about what sort of infrastructure we would build to make that happen. Oh my God, I have like 17 questions about this now. <laughs> I don't have, I won't ask them all, but maybe someday I will okay. ask all these questions. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious to see kind of where, where we're going. It seemed like it was a good response. Yeah, and definitely. It's a cool idea. So, all right. Um, if we, at last call for questions, thoughts, comments on the survey, I'm sure we'll have more to say about this as we dig into the, the narrative and other stuff. Um, have we received any other citizens' comments? No. All right. Well, let no. me double check online here. Okay. My laptop just died. I had not seen any other on YouTube. Okay, great. Then I think we, that means we are adjourned. So thank you all.